I'm going to jump in um, since we don't have that much time. And I just wanted to kind of get um, reactions from all of you. Um, in Toriano, we, we've heard from you both in your opening remarks and through the documentary, but um, what about the film that we just saw? Um, you know, really strikes you, especially given the time when it was was made. Um, and, you know, as you emphasize in your documentary, the fact that it was done by Delta Sigma Theta. Well, I'd really actually say that um, the most thing that, most the biggest thing that intrigued me again was the fact that Delta Sigma Theta had actually made the movie and their purpose and their plan behind it. And the fact that had they been successful, they could have change the way that Hollywood does business. Uh, the film itself, uh, as you could see uh, from some of the, uh, the reviews that I had in my film, it really wasn't well received. Uh, like I think there's someone said that uh, it's a countdown to mediocrity and this film simply falls short and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I would think that the production problems that they had, uh, for instance, they said that uh, the equipment, the first time they went to shoot the equipment, uh, got sent to the wrong dock. Now, was that an accident or was that also part of Hollywood's attempt to not let these ladies you know, be successful? If they had completed the film you know, in the time that uh, Lillian Benmo was still president, of course, you know, there probably would have been you no know, much, much different you know, outcome. Uh, regardless of uh, the film and how it was received, they still could have possibly forewalled it. Uh, the Delta still could have and would have supported it and this film still could have made money. And also, like I mentioned uh, in the documentary, you know, I still believe that uh, it can still make just as much, if not more, money today. Uh, the film itself, I was really surprised when I saw it because, again, it did kind of go along the same venue of a lot of the the black exploitation films, you know, other than the fact that it was actually you know shot in Africa and everything. Um, but other than that, it did do. Uh, what they wanted to do as far as trying to get into uh, cinema. And I also say that I wish I would love, you know, I'm glad that I was able to actually find a print uh, of Countdown to Kusini, but I would love to get my hands on the first shoot that they had when Al Freeman Jr. was the lead actor. And if I could find that footage, I'd be a happy man. Well, you'll have to come and bring it back <laughs> to right here so we can see that. Um, Deborah, as a member of the sorority that's responsible for this film, I mean, what what do you think not only of what was accomplished, but also of um, the viability of this film actually being resurrected, as uh, Toriano says in his documentary, and being promoted and marketed through uh, again as an attempt to to actually gain the type of notoriety for the film that it it you know was robbed of. Um, one of the first things I want to say is, um, in thinking back to the reason and the purpose for um, Delta getting involved in the first place, having to do with images of uh, African Americans in this country uh, versus what we were seeing on the screen at the time. So I kind of looked at the film from that eye. And by the way, uh, he asked me earlier, had I seen the film? I had not. I had been a Delta maybe three years. I think when the film came out, but I had never, I had never seen it. Um, and I think it achieved that purpose. Um, I was struck by um, the positive, strong black woman that Ruby Dee's character was. Um, I was struck by the, uh, not an overemphasis on the violence. A lot of it was attempted, but until the end, you really didn't see a lot of it. So I think from, from those perspectives in terms of um, trying to change how we looked on the film, I think were achieved. I also looked at the message of that film, especially towards the end of the film and thinking, had this film been released widespread in terms of its message, where would we be today? How could it have influenced filmmaking, influenced the Spike Lee, influenced the Tyler uh, Perry? Um, to make films because we had not seen many films based in Africa or based on persons from the African continent. You know, they were all, you know, located in New York City or in, in California. When you look at 
those films, um, the so-called black exploitation films. Um, in terms of it being re-released now, um, I think a lot of work would need to be done in terms of framing the narrative. Um, because if you look at the people who would be going to theaters today, I don't know that they would get it just by looking at the film cold. I don't know if you'd want to show all of Toriano's piece up front, but a lot of the setting the stage and putting it out there, that's a possibility. Yeah. Um, and Charlene, I, you know, as someone who is familiar with some film history, but you are definitely the expert. I'm just really curious to know how Countdown to Cassini resonated with you in terms of its historical importance, um, uh, the fact that a, a black woman was named as executive producer in 1976, um, and Delta Sigma Theta, a, a black sorority, was actually thanked at the beginning of the film. I mean, there are so many different things about the film that seem to be, um, you know, unprecedented especially for the time. So talk about just the the sort of the historical context of what was going on besides black exploitation in terms of how black people were actually faring in film, um, especially behind the scenes and, and, and why that's significant. Okay, um, my uh, first reaction is that it definitely grew out of this tradition of uh, blacks making their own films and this was something that started much earlier than people probably uh, are aware of, that uh, there were black filmmakers in Chicago making films as early as like 1911 and 1913, and you had the Noble and George P. Johnson brothers of the Lincoln Motion Picture Company making films around the same time. And you even had a few women filmmakers. Eloise Gist made religious films out of Washington, and I think uh, Bichetta Merritt, who's not here, but she was involved in like uh, at least identifying some of her works. Uh, so she was important. Zora Neale Hurston was also considered one of the early black female filmmakers. So the fact that the Deltas took on this project, I think was sort of awesome and phenomenal. And I think that's probably one of the more important points as to why it should be preserved. I had no idea that they had made this film and today was my first time seeing the film. So I want to applaud um, Toriana for the documentary in terms of interviewing the women about how it was made, how it was produced, how they financed the film, how they intended to distribute the film. And also I want to applaud some of the black actors who appeared in it in terms of the fact that they were willing to work with this film, even though they already had big names in Hollywood. Uh, so the fact that they were invested in this work as well was incredibly important. But um, there were other things, so many themes that um, were very familiar and very important in terms of the unification between American blacks and Africans. That's very important. They emphasize that at the end of the film. And as somebody mentioned previously, the fact that it was even shot in Africa was also incredibly important. And I was trying to think of other films shot in Africa, and I thought about Shaft in Africa, and also <laughs> the Thriller in Manila. <laughs> so, I mean, this is another reference point, you know, that I think is important. Um, and there's so many other things that I could say. Uh, definitely the music was uh, a reflection of the uh, black exploitation era. And I think that really coincided with the film's narrative, you know, sort of speeding up some of the scenes and incidents that occur in the film. So there's a lot that I could say. So I hope that addressed some of what you asked Absolutely. Me. No, absolutely. Um, Toriano, and, and actually all of you, can address this if, if you would like, but I'm wondering if uh, you think images of black people have have improved since this effort on the part of Delta Sigma Theta to, to change the narrative, to shift it. Well, I would say, of course, they've improved, but like with a lot of things, sometimes it's, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, I mean, of course, there are a lot more of more variety of images uh, but specifically talk about the way more they change and more they stay the same. You know, it seems like just historically, especially when it comes to uh, comedic actors, you know, at one time, uh, you know, Step and Fetch It, Nick and Perry, as they say, you know, he was the highest paid actor in Hollywood, black or white. And I think that today there are some uh, black actors uh, that may be closer to 
him than they would be to Sidney Poitier, that are also some of the highest paid actors, you know, in Hollywood. So, you know, looking at that, uh, I find that, you know, very interesting. Um, Why do you think that is? I mean, what what's what's still going on that would allow for comedians to be the highest paid actors? Well, part of it, I, I believe, is, again, just the the images. You know, we can be laughed at. We can be laughed with. You know, we can be funny. But whenever we become something else, we become a threat. You know, and I think there's that whole thing about the threat of, you know, the, the black man or the black image. I truly believe that, you know, that is well-founded in, you know, the fact that you can have a black man running away from the police and that police officer still is so threatened that he's got to shoot him in the back. You know, even though he's running away, that police officer is supposedly still, you know, furious for his life. And so that is a very powerful, you know, thing to look at, you know, and even going way back to, you know, Birth of a Nation, D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation. 1915 and what that film actually did to disrupt and destroy race relation, relations around the world, and I think you know, the effects are still coming on today, is just the fact that uh, news media, you know, news media, television, in fact, when I was living in Philadelphia for a few years, um, it seems like, and even other places, if you're watching television and they say, oh, you know, someone robbed a bank, someone killed somebody, someone did this, it could even be a mass murder, okay? I mean, if the person was, you know, Caucasian, you don't see any pictures of them. You don't see the picture on television, on the news. You don't see them on the front page of the paper. But if it's somebody black, then you see them going into court, coming out of court. You know, you see the mug shot. You see this, you know, we open up the next paper, paper the next day. There is mug shots right on the paper. And they actually physically show these images, you know, and I believe that that has a lot to do, you know, with how, you know, the black image is perceived. In fact, I was watching this thing on, um, I think it was CNN or something they were talking about, and, and this guy's white guy was, it was really, a, I think, a profound statement he made, because you know, they were talking about Black Lives Matter. And he made the statement, he said, black lives don't matter as much as white comfort. You know, and I think that has a lot to say, a lot to do with anything. So just to wrap it up, yeah, we have a lot more, you know, um, images to choose from. And there are the good, there are the powerful, you know, there are the mighty. And then there are also just some of those, uh, you know, ones that kind of reflect back that aren't really that positively reflective of our culture. Deborah, did you want to add to that? Because if not, I got another question for you. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm wondering what, um, how, so given the fact that, that, you know, we, Toriano's documentary explains what happened to Countdown to Cassini and, and, and how it was basically sabotaged. Um, what is my question? Mm, it's leaving me. I guess the, what I'm trying to get at is, do you, do you feel like it was a mistake for Delta to even venture into this arena of filmmaking that, that none of the women had, had really had a background in, or or is it the sort of thing where um, you know nothing ventured, nothing gained, and so the the positive that potentially could come out of it was worth the effort. I think at some point you have to step out there, and you have to step out on faith. And I, um, in looking at your documentary, and from what I know, I believe that the leadership at the time thought that, and that we could make it work. Um, no. They didn't have any background in it at all. Um, I don't know who may have been advising them, uh, either from a legal perspective or someone already in the entertainment area um, to, to help. I think had there been someone to really be there for them to help walk them through, again, I don't know that, that, that it wasn't, but maybe it could have avoided some of the pitfalls. But given the 70s, and given an organization of predominantly African Americans, and in this case, African American women, for them to have decided, let's step out here on faith and let's do, someone has got to step out here and be the first. It just so happened that it didn't work out and others didn't follow. 
but let's look at the thinking. Suppose this had worked. Maybe to large sums of money, but even break even. Then, you know, much like he said in his film, then there are other organizations that go, wow, they did it. Let's try to do this. It could have been the NAACP. It could have been, you know, the links of the Greek organizations, the churches or what have you. So I have to applaud the organization for having the forethought. They had in mind, they could visualize in their mind how this could work, and it made sense. If you think about how it could work in terms of getting, you know, chapters to support, members to support, and then bringing in family and friends and how it could have worked. But I think not being aware of the obstacles that could occur, and in fact did occur, I think is probably what helped to doom it. Mm -hmm. To that point, or along the same lines, Charlene, I'm really fascinated by the... Um, the, the line of thought that, um, I can't remember her name, Toriano, she, she's the chair of um, communication studies at uh, University of Michigan that's in your film. Robin 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 yes, yes. So when she, oh, okay. Well, on the screen it says University of Michigan. Okay, that's where she was then. Okay. Um, you know, she, she talks about, in terms of the legacy of the film, you know, that it, very well could have been the, uh, or she actually doesn't say it could have been. She says it it potentially was mm -hmm. the beginning of the infrastructure for Nollywood. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I'm really interested to hear what you think about that. Um, and, 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 you know, what, do you think that that actually could have been the trajectory? I mean, given the fact that as Toriano says in the documentary, Hollywood was not really going to let these black women, you know, come up with a way of making films and, and, and distributing them that was going to bypass their system. I don't know that much about Nollywood or Bollywood, but I do know Bollywood is huge, and I do know Nollywood is gaining uh, ground and getting a lot of attention. Uh, but I do think that this film was incredibly important, even if it wasn't distributed, even if it failed, at least in terms of making money, uh, even if it wasn't, you know, distributed widely, because it's a historical moment in terms of the efforts of black women to come together and support this film. And it's a historical moment in terms of the fact that this particular organization did so. And as uh, Toriana hints at or alludes to in his documentary, other organizations could have done similar things, such as the Elks or other fraternities or other sororities. So for me, it speaks to this um, very important uh, ambition among African Americans to control their own image as opposed to having others control uh, your image. And so that's what I find so fascinating about it. It's, it was, to some extent, independently produced and were it not for black independent films, we would really have no positive and, That's you know, right. uh, important and relevant uh, representations of African Americans. So for me, just the fact that it still exists and we saw it and it, others can see it is incredibly important because of what it speaks to in terms of independent cinema. And it is potentially possible that it paved the way for Nollywood. And it was also a precursor uh, to later filmmakers like Oprah or Tyler Perry and Tyler Perry probably needs to see this and take a page from the Deltas in terms of representation. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, but that's just so my uh, my less public opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I just want to, um, you know, offer the opportunity to audience members to ask any questions that you may have, since we do not have that much time, and it's hard for me to see, but I do see. A gentleman in the middle, just stand on up and ask your question. And project, please. Before you make it difficult to be uh, DJ Jake's does, in terms of what was done earlier, you know, because he's doing it out of, he's a minister of and he's doing it out of church, in terms of some of the movies he's produced, I guess. Yeah, well, uh, basically, it was, he said, is it something like uh, what T.D. Jakes is doing as far as like the, the controlled market distribution system? 
the fact that T.D. Jakes is a minister. He has, you know, a large congregation as well as probably, you know, the entire, you know, black religious community, you know, that would come in and back him. And of course, some other religious communities. But I say it is very similar. I say it's very similar, whether he actually knew about, you know, what the Deltas did in Countdown and Cassini and or the actual concept of a controlled market distribution system, you know, and got that from the Deltas, what they did, I don't know. But yes, what T.D. Jakes has done and is doing, I think, is very similar. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Everybody hear the question? Okay. Um, basically, um, the lady who stood up uh, is a member of Delta Sigma Theta. She's been a member for 51 years. Um, she wanted us to, to know, be clear about the fact that Ruby D was an honorary member at that time and that she was an active member uh, as long as she was as physically and mentally able to, to be so. And the question, Actually, Toriana, you can. Well, the question was that uh, whether or not I uh, had reached out to Delta Sigma Theta nationally when I started doing this. Yes, I had, and I did. Before I even found the film, I had reached out to the Deltas. I have yet to have anyone from national organization reach get back to me. They have. I've been totally ignored with this, uh, as far as the national organization is concerned. Um, after I did uh, the first version of my documentary, uh, I even had a screening of the, well, she's not anymore, but at that time, the current chair of the Arts and Letters Commission who was out in LA, I met with her, we had lunch, we talked, I showed her the documentary. She said she saw my vision and she would get, you know, it to the, you know, appropriate um, people. Uh, never heard anything. I contacted her back. She said she had gotten the information to the appropriate people. I have still not heard anything. Um, unfortunately, one time I actually had a screening out in LA, this was about two years ago, uh, at the Mamie Clayton Library and Museum, uh, you know, which is the organization that you know houses the 16 millimeter print. And one of my friends from Arizona State was actually, or is actually, well, I, don't, I don't know if she still is, but she was actually the president of the Century, Century City alumni chapter out there in LA. And so she was setting up an additional screening for me. The night before, the day before the screening, supposedly someone from the national headquarters called her and said, this film has not been vetted by Delta Sigma Theta. We don't know if it shows the organization in a positive light, blah, 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 blah. She said she was not told not to hold the screening. But she felt that, you know, if she did hold it, there might be some blowback. So she canceled the screening. And that was very painful, very hurtful, because I felt that here it is, 40 years later, the organization did to me what Columbia Pictures did to them back then. Uh, that said, I at least said, because I had sent um, emails, I made phone calls. I even, because you know, I was teaching at Howard, I dropped a package of information on the doorstep of the national headquarters. Never heard anything from anybody. I at least said at this point, at least now I'm on their radar, okay? They had the link to the documentary, you know, on YouTube, no, on Vimeo, I believe it was. You know, at least now they'll look at it, now they'll vet it, and they'll either say, okay, Mr. Berry, we wanna work with you, or mind your business, leave us and our film alone. I still have heard nothing from Delta National which was very, 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 again, disheartening. So that's why, like, my 
comment in the, in the beginning. I put on the show. I walked away. Um, so I will say that um, in the film, he does get a chance to interview uh, past presidents of Detroit alumni. He also had a telephone interview with Dr. Jean Noble, um, who you know is our 12th national president, but she was also, I mean, yeah, 12, uh, but she was also the first chair of the National Arts and Letters Commission. And um, so there are some deltas. Oh, and, and the past um, chair, uh, treasurer, national treasurer, who was national treasurer under uh, Lillian Bimbo um, at, during the time of the filming. So those voices you do see on the film. Deborah, actually, to, I just want to follow up on what the question sort of brought up because one of the really interesting aspects of what happened. Um, with Countdown at Cassini is the fact that Lillian Bimbo um, basically finished her tenure as president and the new president, and I guess the new, I don't know how the, what the structure is, but the new administration was not really interested, it sounds like from Toriano's documentary, in pursuing the film um, or promoting it any further. So I'm interested in just, you know, today, if there were a call um, for Delta Sigma Theta to, to get together and support and try and promote the film, now what, what kind of politics do you think would come up around this issue? And, and, and do you think there would be that same sort of divide where there'd be some who think it, this is amazing that we did something like this and those who would feel like, you know what, it's not really that important? Um, for anyone who's a member of any kind of organization, um, be it the church, be it the PTA, be it sorority, fraternity, or whatever, knows that when there's a, a, a leadership administration um, that's in, in charge or has been appointed or elected to lead, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the administrations that follow have that same vision. And so what it sounds like is, and I certainly cannot speak and do not speak for Delta Sigma Theta, um, but based on what I saw in the, in the documentary, um, so what it looks like is the administration that followed did, maybe didn't have the same vision as Lily and Bimbo's. And so maybe they just, you know, sometimes in organizations, um, we have a tendency to drop things and to move on to other things because we come in with a vision, and this is what we'd like to have accomplished. Um, we may continue what happened in the previous administration or say, mm, no, I think I'd rather do things this way and tend to drop it. Um, it's hard to say what would happen if it were to resurrect and be released now. Um, given the difficulties you've had with trying to get response from our, uh, the national headquarters organization and current administration, it may be, it may be some difficulty. So I think that there has to be some education first because you have a whole generation with an S of folk who've never heard of this movie, never knew Delta Sigma Theta produced the movie. And I mean, you know, even Deltas because it wasn't necessarily promoted and pushed um, after 1976. So I'm sure there are some of my sorority sisters who have no idea that this was even done. So again, I think it would have to be an education process from the beginning up to if, if this were to be done again. But we obviously would have to get buy-in from the administration and then on down. So it would have to be, uh, we'd, ha we'd have to work within our structure and how we do it. Thank you for bringing this to us. I appreciate you seeing it from beginning to end. But I do want to ask quickly, I thought I heard that uh, Delta Sigma Theta owns this film. Columbia Pictures is who they went to to distribute the film. They actually distributed the film. So since they're distributing, they put all of their logos and everything on it. Uh, again, as the documentary says, that was the Delta, the Countdown to Cusini's downfall, right? If they had maintained their original um, four wall or you know controlled market distribution campaign, had each individual chapter set up screenings, you know, sell tickets, 
fill up the theater, show the movie, take it to the next one, take it to the next one, it would have been a totally different um, scenario. Also, I'm sure you heard about uh, Lottie Ladevo, who was uh, Nancy Davis Ruby D's son-in-law, who actually brought the project too. I was in contact with him um, through email. He's back over in Africa. And that's one of the things, he was very, very disappointed at the time. He wanted to maintain the four wall principle when they decided to go Hollywood. And so he said he just left and went on and did what he needed to do. So that's why you saw the Columbia Pictures thing because they were responsible for dis distribution. And again, their distribution plan had nothing to do with the Delta Sigmas, Sigma Theta's um, you know, organization. So just quickly, if, they, if it was released as a four wall perhaps or some other way, I would love to take it off <laughs> personally. Um, no, yeah, I, I, I'd love to take it off. Okay, please. Yes, hello. Uh, good evening. I'm Nigerian American. Uh, my name is Bunga. I'm from Nigeria. Uh, I just want to say that I am very happy and very pleased with the film that you showed us. And I think this movie has been distributed back then. Something like coming to coming to, coming to America with giraffes and uh, <laughs> what is good in this movie? Like we see it, the texture of life in Nigeria. I mean, you know, Africa, you know, class, urban, urban Africans, rural Africans, African spirituality. You know, the, uh, you know, we were, my husband and I were surprised to see uh, uh, Yoruba killing the system, you know, spirituality. Mm -hmm. So they did a lot, and then they used. Trains, they use uh, cars, they use boats. I mean, they, they, they did great things. They did so much of that. If this had been seen on American screen by American, uh, by Americans, the question of do you live on trees is going to be happening. I'm, I'm so uh, I'm glad that I'm, I'm, I feel very proud of what they did, and I'm sure this, this will mean a lot of things to a lot of people. Even to people Nollywood. And by the way, Nollywood is a recent occurrence, and you should, its history is funny. The way Nollywood started, the fact, you know, the relationship with this, this movie does not exist. That was a strong uh, television culture in Nigeria. Television came to Nigeria in 1959, Western Nigeria. So we had a long history of family. And, but anyway, this is a wonderful movie. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Cynthia. Thank you, and uh, I feel a little less embarrassed that I didn't know about the film, and I kept trying to put it in the context of other uh, filmmakers that um, I sort of learn about that I didn't know about. But um, the thing, the the really the besides the model for movie making and distribution, the thing that struck me is the philanthropic model. And I, this may have something to do with the Delta res, uh, response. It, it sort of, you know, $1.2 million, that seems like it was an investment that didn't pay off. But it is, and it will pay off. It, it, and so I think, you know, the Deltas have to claim this and honor the impact that this film has had. And so my, my questions are about, are, you know, DST, I'm assuming they have the copyright for the movie. I'm working in a library, so I'm interested in that kind of thing. And about the history, if there's any mention in the archives of this movie, because you don't, an organization doesn't just brush something this significant under the you know, rug, the archives will tell a story. And I'm just wondering in the history of the Deltas, if this film is mentioned. Yes. It is. It, it's, uh, it's in our archives and it's mentioned, but it's not taught, if you will. Um, it's mentioned kind of, it's just, it's just there. It's something we did, it's there. But not delving into the where's wherewithals and, and and so the strength of it has not been emphasized. I think from where you are. So I've only been a Delta for twenty eight years, but I have two copies 
of the soundtrack because the national convention was in Atlanta, the second term for um, Sora Benbo, and as they were like going through their thing, my mother managed to get two copies and I hold both of them because I always want to know where they are. <laughs> but is it taught? That's the yes. question. When I, is it when I was in, in, in the history? 1990 in Cincinnati alumni, they taught us about it. It's not, it, and so I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that, but I wouldn't say that that was across our thousands of chapters. Yeah. 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 Um, anyway, I, I really appreciate uh, you know you Deltas being here because I have had screenings um, that there was not one Delta in the house. I had a screening at a friend's church in New York City. I sent um, letters and emails to eight different Delta chapters in New York and New Jersey. Not one Delta showed up. So uh, okay. <laughs> Okay, there's one last question that we want to get in before we have to leave. Yeah, so I, I want to argue that it wasn't just an economic question alone in terms of what would happen in terms of Hollywood distribution, but it was also a political question. <laughs> if you look at the politics of this movie, strong politics in line with what was happening across the continent in terms of national liberation struggles, right? These are some of the things I think that kept people away, right? That the political establishment in this country wasn't happy about it, right? And two, when Asi says at the end, we need to bring African Americans and Africans together, it wasn't just on a question of culture, it was on politics as well. And so I would think that maybe even the subsequent administrations of the Deltas, maybe they thought they were gonna get a, a Cliff Huxtable movie. <laughs> In terms, no, I'm serious, in, in terms of images, right? Like we're professionals, we're this and that, but they got a strong political story uh, with the help of Asi and all the others that, that wrote that. So I just, that's something to think about uh, beyond just the economic question. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Can I say one more thing real quick? Um, i like to take a, uh, a page out of uh, Haile Grima's book, who uh, was in my documentary. Of course, he was the uh, director and distributor of his film, Sankofa. At the screenings, he would actually ask people, he said, just clapping and saying you had a good time and you enjoyed the film does him no good. If you go leave here this theater, tell the next five or ten people you talk to about what you experienced here today and help to get the word spread and help to hopefully try to get some kind of buzz going so that uh, people can know. Thank you. Quick question before you all go. How many people saw this movie in a theater? I'm the only one. You mean in 76? Yeah, I'm the only one. So, yeah, I was, I, my life was boring. So, yeah. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you. All right, one more thing, same as self-promotion. Uh, along with making films, since it costs so much, I've actually uh, started writing books. I have uh, some early uh, copies of my first novel, Tears, which deals with racism in America. And uh, anyone who may know someone in the publishing industry looking for a good book on racism, I'll give you a copy to get to them, okay? Thank you. <laughs>